Today on The Report, we discuss the death of Queen Elizabeth II and what this means for the United Kingdom. Plus, the aftermath of the stabbing massacre in Saskatchewan, Canada. The impact of California's deadliest heat wave on record. And how a campus bicycle theft led to the arrest of a wanted man. The report starts now. Hello, I'm Enrique Medina. I'm Elmira Darmanian. I'm Anthony Bautista. And I'm Amanda Nemec. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at the Report CSUF or on our Titan TV Instagram at Titan TV CSUF to keep in touch with us and view our new content. Monarch of the United Kingdom and head of the Commonwealth, Queen Elizabeth II has passed away at the age of 96. On September 8th at Balmoral Castle, only hours after her passing, crowds of mourners gathered together to honor her memory amidst a downpour. However, in a rather astounding turn of events, heavy rains came to a halt and a large double rainbow could be spotted just over the palace. Following a state funeral service held on September 19th, the Queen will be laid to rest at St. George's Memorial Chapel within her Berkshire estate, Windsor Castle. The Queen's eldest son, newly appointed King Charles III, stated, quote, We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the commonwealth, and by countless people around the world, end quote. Ascending to the throne in 1952, Queen Elizabeth II had overseen the United Kingdom for over seven decades. This cements her as the longest serving British monarch and female head of state in history. Her death marks the end of an era and will be a significant change for the United Kingdom. So what are your thoughts about the Queen Elizabeth passing? I truly believe that her death is gonna be a significant turning point in the history, not only for British people, but also for people all over the world because I believe that Elizabeth II was kind of a symbol of the United Kingdom, so. Yeah, I think another thing to mention upon her death is uh, right now Great Britain's going through a time of political turmoil, economic troubles, economic hardships. Um, I think at this point, it's always helpful to know you have a figure of stability and she was that for 70 plus years. So to not have that anymore is a big hit to the people of Great Britain. So to see how they react to that is gonna be very interesting to see. And the longest monarch. I agree, I agree. And like you said, uh, she provided a, a sense of stability. Um, so that'll be hard for King Charles III to follow that up. Um, not only that, he's entering his reign at 73 years old. So that makes him the oldest monarch to ever ascend to the throne in British history. Um, so really that might hurt like how the public views him and like what expectations they set for him due to his older age. Um, but the queen was like a, a, a consistent uh, figurehead for a lot of people, not only just in, in Great Britain, but globally. I definitely agree with you and I think that he first needs to gain people's trust in him and the way he's going to be in charge because I feel like British people had kind of a stability when the Queen was in charge and now it's someone new. He needs to gain the trust definitely. Yeah and on top of that when you mentioned stability, um, can King Charles III actually provide that and also on top of that uh, can he provide stability in international relations and uh, just really anything politics that it comes to Great Britain and making sure they're at their best state possible. For now we'll just have to wait and see how King Charles III will lead the country. On Sunday, September 4th, a mass stabbing occurred in an indigenous community in central Saskatchewan, Canada, where 10 people died and 18 were injured. The massacre was committed by two brothers, Damien and Miles Sanderson. However, that Monday, authorities revealed that Damien was found dead in James Smith Cree Nation, where the first attack occurred. Last Wednesday, following his brother's death, Miles Sanderson was found and arrested by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Authorities acted on a call reporting that Sanderson was seen outside a home northeast of the town of Waco with a knife. He then stole a white Chevrolet avalanche truck and fled the property. 
Eventually, the vehicle was spotted on a nearby highway where police directed the truck off the road and into a ditch. Sanderson was then arrested on charges of first-degree murder, attempted murder, and breaking and entering into a residence. However, shortly afterwards, he went into, quote, medical distress, end of quote, and was subsequently pronounced dead. Shortly after the incident, the RCMP Assistant Commissioner Rhonda Blackmore said the Saskatoon Police Service and the Saskatchewan Incident Response Team would conduct an investigation into Sanderson's death. A press conference was held that Wednesday where families of some of the victims who died spoke about the tragic death of their loved ones. So, since both suspects in the crime have now died, how do you think we can provide some closure for people who lost their loved ones in this event? I think that overall, the fact that both of them died doesn't really give that clarity and closure that those families need, regardless of if even if there were suspects, you know, it's still not going to bring their family members back. And so I think all we can really do is just, you know, send them our condolences, our love, our prayers. What about you guys? What do you think? I agree, and especially in such a small community like the James Smith Cree community was uh, only about 200 people, so about 10% of the people that lived there were affected by this. Um, I'm sure the community will never be the same. Family gatherings will probably never be the same. Um, but what they can do is find a sense of unity and strength between each other, um, because that who was the, that those people that were there before this happened are going to be the same ones that were there after this happened, and um, that community needs to come together. And also, what level of risk do you think is acceptable for police to take when attempting to stop and arrest someone? Because the reason of um, Sanderson's death is still not clear. Yeah, well, when I think when it comes down to the situation, we need to be aware that there was a massacre going on. So I'm not surprised in, this, in the way the police actually handled the situation. Um, you could say in an aggressive manner. Uh, there's always that question, how aggressive can police be or should they be? But I guess in this situation, uh, given who it was and what was actually occurring with the Sanderson brothers, uh, I'm not surprised in the way they handled the situation. I'm not either. Um, you know, it, especially given um, Miles' uh, criminal history, he has a history of 59 convictions, including assault and robbery. Roughly half were for failing to comply with pre-existing orders. So. Uh, this is a very violent person that they had to deal with, so I don't think they were out of line. Really great points you bring up, Anthony. Fact of the matter is we can only send our condolences and prayers to that community, so we're really hoping they could uh, get out of this uh, more united, as you had mentioned earlier, but only time will tell. Last week, California experienced its deadliest heat wave on record, and this extreme heat led to the California Independent System Operator issuing its highest level energy emergency alert due to the power grid not meeting the state's electrical needs. Northern California was faced with rolling blackouts and was asked by officials to reduce the consumption of electricity and to use generators by officials shortly after. Governor Gavin Newsom posted a video on Twitter urging Californians to conserve power after 4 p.m., to turn their thermostat up to 78 degrees or higher, and to avoid using any large appliances. The flex alert was officially declared over on Friday, September the 9th, when the heat wave started to dissipate due to Hurricane K coming in from the Baja California Peninsula. So when it comes to this situation, energy limitations during a heat waves, um, do you think we should have these energy limitation warnings? Do you think it's the right way to go about it during heat wave season? I think the best way for us to go about this, even though as a large scale Realistically, not everybody not everybody's gonna turn off all their power starting right at four. So I think just awareness and consciousness and just as a community, I mean, we are all living in California. We are all going through this just to come together and even just give one percent. Instead of instead of having two fans go on, why not have just one fan? or two lights, or just have one, if you could just cut it down and just give 1%, even by a little bit, you know, I would say that's good enough. I agree, I think it, it takes uh, a group effort, but at the same time, I think it also takes like, um, some kind of like government leadership to come in and help those communities that, that might not have the same resources, like low income communities, um, communities within the inner city that might not have like generators nearby. I know uh, a lot of government officials were telling people, oh, just turn on your generators. 
but for a lot of people they might not have access to a lot of those resources so i think that's where the government should come in and like provide some sort of bridge for those that don't have the same resources that might not even have an ac to turn off let alone turn on um, so I, I think that's where it would take more than just a, a community effort definitely i have to agree i have to agree um yeah a really great point to bring up uh as far as different policy that we could bring about to you know really improve the situation you know global warming is a real thing do you think there's any other sort of measures that we can take as far as uh, you know heat waves like this or very hot temperatures i would say just be conscious be aware you know everybody's going through it so it's not just one person we're all in this together you know california so the best thing we could do is just support each other and encourage each other and just be aware and not forget to take care of yourself because this is really important definitely I agree and being in the region that we're in i mean california is probably leading the nation in like alternate energy sources and different ways that you can use energy that might not exactly harm uh, the power grids the same way that like fossil fuels and other uh combustion uh, combustion type sources. Uh, so I think California is in, heading in the right direction, but it'll be a little bit before like we get the situation figured out because heat waves are inevitable. inevitable. Um, they're only gonna keep coming. They're gonna keep getting worse. Um, according to the EPA in the last uh, five decades, um, the intensity and the frequency of heat waves have only increased. So it's only a matter of when, not if. It's a good point. Well, we'll have to stay tuned. Yeah, I 100% agree we're all in this together, but I believe that people also should take care of themselves. A wanted man was arrested on campus on Thursday afternoon after trying to steal a bicycle and getting caught by police. 34-year-old David Ryan Alo was arrested on suspicion of stealing a bicycle and was then charged with failure to appear on felony charge and vandalism. CSUF PD claims Alo was perched on a bike trying to disguise himself as a CSUF student, but was recognized by an officer. Alo immediately attempted to flee the scene, running into oncoming traffic and hiding in the men's restroom on the first floor of College Park, where he was found by campus police. Police found his backpack in a nearby trash can where they, they discovered a meth pipe, but no bolt cutters used to steal the bike. Alo claims he used his teeth to cut the cable. A student witness claims to have seen officers running and searching for the suspect, even asking students if they had seen him. The witness claims it was a scary experience to see so many officers pull onto the lawn for one man. CSU PD Captain Willie reminds students to register their bikes with campus police via the bike app or the registration form available online to prevent, prevent bike theft. To raise mental health awareness, a man plans to travel over 800 miles with only his skateboard. Last Monday, Mike Crispino started his four-week long journey by skateboard from his hometown of Eugene, Oregon, all the way to San Francisco, California. The goal? To raise $20,000 for a memorial at Washington Jefferson Park. The memorial will be honoring two young skaters, Ben Moody and Silas Strimple, who unfortunately passed away as a result of mental illness. Mike plans to skate 30 miles per day as a minimum and expects the journey to take about 27 and a half days. As a safety precaution, Mike's friend, Ethan Hall, will be driving alongside him by car throughout the extensive trip. Mike feels both excited and rightfully nervous about the ordeal, but he remains committed to the cause and will be documenting it for all, for all the world to see. You can follow along his expedition through the Emerald Shred Collective's Instagram page, which will offer links to his live videos and also a GoFundMe page where you can donate to his mission. And with that, that's all the time we have for today. Have a safe week, everybody. And stay tuned for more news, views, and info. We'll see you next time on The Report.